All right, I have no idea what that means that he just said, but we'll be in 1 Corinthians this morning. Jackie and I have a, a consistent competition going on. He's a north side guy, and uh, he is still really, really hurt from the way the Greenwood north side game ended this year. So we shot that video on uh, the same time. And so I w- wanted you to know that I did that video in one take, and Jackie did that video in three takes. So <laughs> Greenwood wins again, just so you know. This is our last uh, Sunday in the Wisdom series, and we're going to look at a passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. But I want to open this, this uh, teaching this morning and read you a passage out of 2 Timothy. And you can see that on the screen or on your app. It says this, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it. And how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. And I want to frame this message and just remind us that as much as we would like to think otherwise, things are just not going to get better. Talking about our culture, talking about the wisdom of the world, the testimony of Scripture reveals that our culture will slowly progress away from the truths that are set forth by God in Scripture. We see in this passage in 2 Timothy that I read, verse 13 says that when it says, Evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. This means that the sinful, chaotic culture in which we live will continue to express its desire to live in opposition in every way to God's word. Now in our homes and in our individual lives and in our families as Christ followers, we can experience peace and we can experience hope because of Jesus But if our communities and our governments and our culture continually and continue to stiff arm the things of God, there's going to be this continual and gradual slide and descent toward evil things. Collectively as a culture, it is just not going to get better until Jesus comes back or we experience a supernatural revival. Because we know that things that we would have never imagined would happen have happened. And the things that even now that we think could never possibly happen will likely one day happen. And it's not going to get better and until Jesus returns. And according to scripture, he will make all things new. Now, this doesn't feel like great news. But it's important news. And it's a reminder that every day, church, is another day that's closer to when Jesus comes back and makes all things new. And we can also be reminded that in the midst of living as salt and light, as Scripture says, in a culture that is far from God, in a world that continually rejects the things of God, we can be reminded that Scripture meets us at that place. And we can be reminded that it alerts us to this downward spiral of the ungodly culture that we find ourselves in. Because you remember, when sin entered the heart of humanity, it forever changed everything. And you and I are living now with the consequences of the sins of our first parents, which we read about in Genesis 3, 23 and 24. that tells us that because of sin, the sin of Adam and Eve, that God essentially kicked them out of the garden, out of their priestly and unbroken communion with God. So they lived outside of God's promises and outside of God's provision at that point and forever lived with the consequences of their sin and injected that sin nature into humanity to everyone that was born since then. And we are still in 2022 living with the consequences of a fallen sinful world as humans. So here's the first thing I want you to consider as we open up this passage in Corinthians and it's this, the wisdom of the world will continually lead us to live in opposition to God. I'll mention this again this morning and we mentioned it a couple of times in this series. There's really only two types of wisdom that we can live with. We can live with the wisdom of the world, which is ungodly, unspiritual, and demonic, as Scripture says. Or we can live by the wisdom of God, which is from His truth. There's really no middle ground. We are living our lives surrendered and subject 
to one type of wisdom, the wisdom of the world or the wisdom of God. But just know this, that the wisdom of the world that's unspiritual and demonic, that wisdom will never lead us to peace with God. It will never lead us to God. It will always lead us away from God and living in opposition to God. And our culture that we live in, the world we live in is, is an ungodly culture and it celebrates every single move away from truth. Subtly at times. We find ourselves in a culture that I believe is continually sending the message that we need to evolve and that we need to adapt. And those that refuse to evolve or adapt in these times are simply labeled as intolerant. And it seems like every single week I read something or hear something on the issues of marriage and on the issues of gender, things that have been clearly spelled out in the scriptures where we are created in the image of God, male and female, he created them, and that marriage is to be one man and one woman created by God for life. And at times we are continually hearing reports that we need to re redefine marriage for the times that we live. We need to adapt, we need to evolve, we need to, to take another look at what gender is and, and bring ourselves up to where the times and that people should be free to love who they want to love and they should be free to be who they feel they are on the inside. And the once held biblical standards of marriage are now seen as archaic and even narrow-minded. And the beauty of gender and the beauty of being made in the image of a holy God is now seen as a choice that each one of us is free to make, not based on who God says we are or created us to be, but simply based on who we feel we are which is often the result of a desire to simply live a perverse life. And there are countless more examples, church, of how we as are living in a culture that is continually moving further and further and further away from the truths laid out in God's word. We are continually told to adapt, to evolve in all these ways. And as Christians and in the church, we need to recognize that at times and admit at times that we've been captured and captivated by the culture. And we've been captured by the wisdom of the world. And maybe even in our own lives, it's caused us to question God's truths. And maybe even in our lives, it's caused us to be swayed away from God's truth or swayed away from things. Or we don't want to feel like we're irrelevant in the culture. But you see, the tension for believers, the tension really for the local church, and the tension for followers of Jesus is this. There will come a time in all of these issues in our lives where the wisdom of the culture collides with the wisdom of God, and we have to make a choice, and we often have to make a stand. There's, there's going to be times in your life, whether it's at your job, in your family, in your relationships, where the, this wisdom of the world, what the world says about something, and what the Scriptures say about something, those things are going to collide and we have to make a choice in those moments about who are we going to trust and who are we going to believe. And this passage, I think, teaches us about how we can lean hard on the wisdom of God. You see, this is not an isolated issue for the time we live. This is not a 2022 thing. This is the same issue that the people of Corinth were facing in the mid-50s A.D., just one generation after the resurrection. And so as the body of Christ there existed in an ungodly culture, the Corinthians struggled at the same time with immorality and they struggled with idolatry. And so the passage we're going to read, Paul writes to correct some of these things within the culture as a whole, the Corinthian culture, but also specifically and essentially to the believers who were living there. So I want us to read together in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting in verse 18. And I'm going to read us to the end of the chapter. First Corinthians chapter one, verse 18, it says this, for the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning, I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. 
For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. In verse 18, as this section of this chapter opens, Paul shows this separation of wisdom that we have been talking about. This wisdom that exists in the world. He, he says that it's these two categories that we've mentioned from the very beginning of this series. And he says that there are those who are perishing and that there are those who are being saved. It's two different categories of wisdom. And in each group, Paul shows that this is a work in progress. That it's talking about people that are living a certain way. They're living by the wisdom of the, wor the world. Or when he says those who are being saved, it's talking about those who are in the process of sanctification, those who are being made more like Christ. And we know this because Paul uses what's known as the progressive tense of those words. He says those who are perishing and those who are being saved. And those words, the tense of those words, the lets us know that he's talking about something that is ongoing. Those who are perishing are those who have surrendered their lives to the wisdom of the world, the wisdom that's ungodly and unspiritual. And those then who are being saved, he says, those are those who have surrendered to the wisdom of God and are trying to live out the principles of God in their lives. And so when it comes to the idea of the gospel, the wisdom of the world says the gospel is foolish. That's what he's talking about. He uses the word folly, the those that are outside of faith, those that are rejecting the things of God, the, the idea of the gospel to them, it's folly, it's foolishness. It makes no sense to them. You see, in the Corinthian culture, the idea of a crucified man providing salvation to a sinful world to them was ludicrous. It was foolishness, it was folly. Especially those who claim to be wise by world standards, especially those who claim to have a lot of earthly knowledge, a lot of earthly wisdom, which a lot of people did in the culture that Paul's writing to. It's a very eclectic group. But for those who had been changed by the gospel, who had been changed by the cross, they realized that the cross and the gospel are the power of God. So here's something I want you to consider. Every person lives by wisdom, the wisdom of the world or the wisdom of God. And so what we have to understand and consider is, is how is it that we are living? Are we living by the wisdom of the world or the wisdom of God. So for context, and I guess essentially for fairness to the culture that Paul is writing, it's important to understand how the Corinthian culture viewed death by crucifixion, which was a part of their culture introduced by the Romans. It was an execution that was considered so harsh and so severe that you never would even talk about it or mention it, especially in mixed company. And even though Corinth was a city that had been greatly influenced by the Roman culture, and even though they knew that the Romans had brought crucifixion into the culture, and they were experts and masters of pain, they knew how to crucify somebody to such an extent that it, that it brought to that person the most amount of pain and shame possible. But even in the culture, it was still considered improper to talk about a cross or to talk about death by crucifixion. The people of Corinth, they were well-versed in artistry and culture and the arts, not to mention that many of them were very wealthy. And so Paul's message of the gospel is that those who the world considers wise will see the work of the cross as foolish. These artisans, these wealthy Corinthians, these people that were, that were trying to accumulate all of the knowledge of the world, of language and culture, when, you, when Paul came and he preached to them about the cross of Jesus Christ, they thought he was crazy. And they said, this is absolute folly. That something so improper, something that we're not even supposed to talk about in company could be the means of salvation to us. And see, the Corinthians in their culture, they were very confident people, almost braggadocious about the wisdom of the world, the wisdom that they had, which is likely what prompted Paul to recall the words of Isaiah in his preaching that we see uh, in verse 19 in this passage, which is a, 
is a statement that didn't originate with Paul. It originated with the prophet Isaiah, which is recorded in Isaiah's book, chapter 29, verse 14. It says this, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. You see, this was God's word about those that were living by the world's wisdom. This was God's word to the prophet Isaiah that Paul brings up at this time, reminding them that God will destroy the wisdom of the world. That those that think they're wise in their own eyes, those that are living prideful, that they've accumulated all this knowledge, all these things that they think on their own is going to lead them to a relationship with God. God says, I'm going to destroy those things. And then Paul does what I think is hands out some pretty significant trash talk to the Corinthians, right? In the way that he writes this. So he tells the Corinthians, don't forget that the prophet Isaiah told us long ago that God would destroy the wisdom of the wise. And those that think they're discerning, he will thwart. And so here's where Paul introduces a little bit of a New Testament trash talk. So after he reminds them of what God does with those that are following the world's wisdom, he begins this series of questions. So then Corinthians, this is in verse 20, where, where is the w- one who's wise? Where's the scribe? Where's the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? And Paul essentially is saying to them, where, where's this wisdom that you're talking about? Because God has been very clear about what he thinks about the wisdom of the world. He opposes it. He will thwart it. He will destroy it. It will by no means even sniff the requirements for what is necessary to be right with God. So as Paul explains to them about worldly wisdom, he, I think in kind of a subtle way, saying, so who wants to raise their hand that they're wise now? Who wants to be the scribe? Who wants to be the one that calls himself the great debater of this age? You see, and then we learn the very thing considered foolish in the wisdom of the world is the very thing God used to purchase salvation for us. You see, to the world, the cross was foolish. It was folly. It was something not even be talked about. And so the very thing that the wisdom of the world says is foolish is the very thing that God used to purchase salvation for the world. Look at verse 21 down to verse 25 again. It says, for since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. You see, for Jews demanded signs, Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, for the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Do you remember the story of the woman at the well? She's Jewish, right? And she's, she's asking for a sign and she starts talking about worship. This is what the Jews were always, they were seeking signs. And these Greeks, a lot of them who are in this Corinthian culture, they're they're looking for wisdom. It was all about the wisdom of this world and arts. And they were very eclectic. And they thought that it was these signs and these, the Greeks thought it was these uh, signs and wonders that that they were looking for, this wisdom of the world. They thought all these things were the things that were going to lead them to Christ. But what Paul says is, but it's none of those things. It's not the signs that the Jews are demanding and it's not the wisdom of the world that the Greeks are demanding. It is the cross of Christ and Christ alone. And he says, it's for everybody, both Jews and Greeks. See, wisdom is only found in the cross of Jesus Christ. It's not found in any other way. So here's something I want you to remember. All the acquired wisdom of the world will never lead us to peace with God. All the, all the accolades, all the things that the world can give us will never lead us to peace with God. It might earn us more influence at work. It might give us more accolades, I guess, in the eyes of our friends and neighbors and maybe even more success and maybe even more wealth. But it will still be considered weak and foolish when compared to the wisdom of God to send us a savior by way of the cross that to the world seems like absolute foolishness. And I want us to look at a portion of verse 21 that we just read where it says this, the world did not know God through wisdom. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. The world did not know God through wisdom. You see, God can only be found through the cross of Jesus Christ. 
That's the only place that we find God. That's the only place that we find hope. That's the only place that we find peace. Not through all of the wisdom of the world. You see, the world is constantly searching for peace and for hope and for love through wisdom, through various means of things that the world offers, but we will never find it there. You see, what they consider foolish, the cross is the only way to experience God. Look at verse 26. We see this beautiful explanation about this foolish wisdom and how it's on display. Look at verse 26. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. This is a very uh, direct statement that Paul gives to this culture because, see, many of those he's writing to would, would say that I, I, I'm a, we, I was born noble. I was born into this kind of family or I've, I've attained or achieved all these things. I've got all this wisdom. I've, I've discovered all these things and maybe they have wealth. And so kind of in a direct way, this foolish wisdom that Paul's addressing, he writes to them and he says, listen, not many of you are wise according to your own standards. Not many of you are powerful according to your own standards. Not many of you are of noble birth according to your own standards. And Paul is saying, look, Let's say we just go by your standards of wisdom. Most of you are not even meeting your own standards. You're not as wise as you think you are. You're not as powerful as you think you are. You're not as noble as you think you are. So even if we were going by the world standards, most of you are falling short of your own standards in the first place. And he says, and those that the world considers foolish, weak, and common are the very ones in which God's power is displayed in the greatest ways. The Bible is full of people who are unassuming. If we were to take time to just share stories, you and I, we probably some of the most influential people in our lives, in our, in, in our Christ life, would be people that would be very unassuming to the world. People that would be considered common. People that would be considered regular. So Paul says, look, even if by your own standards of wisdom is what it took to be right with God, most all of you are already falling short because you're not as wise and noble, as powerful as you think you are. And I think all of us in some way are foolish and weak and sinful and under, undeserving of the salvation that's offered to us. But God chose us for salvation so that the world would see his power and so that the world would see that wisdom comes from him. And so because he did that, not only does that shame those who claim peace can be found in the wisdom of the world, but it also ensures that all the glory of our salvation is directed to God and to God alone. Because what's the testimony of most of our lives? It's look, if God could change my life, then he could change anybody's, right? If God could change somebody like us, if God could change somebody like me, then he could change anybody, right? That, that's our story. We are We are that person. And so as the passage begins to close, we see what is essentially in this passage, kind of Paul's mic drop statement in verse 29, when he says, so that no human might boast in the presence of God. You see, no one will ever stand before God having received salvation from God and say to themselves, I did it. I did it on my own. I pursued God. I found God. He never was looking for me, but I found him. Y'all didn't find him, but I found him. And here I stand in the presence of a holy God for all eternity. No one is ever going to say that. Ever. The wisdom of the world will never lead us to pursue God. It will only lead us to pursue more of our flesh and our desires. So Paul reminds him, listen, And the reason that the wisdom of God is found in the person of Christ is so that no human being might boast in the presence of God, so that we would never even begin to allow ourselves to think it has anything to do with us. Listen, if you've been radically changed by the person of Jesus Christ, it has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with the wisdom found on the cross of Jesus Christ. And that's true for my life, and that's true for your life. If you are in a space and place in your life where you're beginning to seek more of God, that's because God has been pursuing you and seeking you and nudging you and prompting your spirit in your heart. And so Paul, as he gets to the end, he said in 28, God chose those that are low and those that the world cast off and those that are despised. And he said he did that so we would remember that there's no way that we can boast about our salvation in the presence of God because it's all about God. And do you know what this is in this passage and to the Corinthian culture? It's a death blow to those that are holding tightly to the idea 
that they can somehow find peace with God through wisdom on their own. It's a death blow to those who think they can be good enough to be right with God. This statement is is a death blow to those that think that salvation is somehow earned, that you can be good enough or right enough to be right with God so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. Church, if we live by the wisdom of the world, it is going to lead us further and further away from God. It will never lead us one step closer to God. It is only by the cross of Jesus Christ, which he displayed for us. It is only through the wisdom of God that we can experience the peace of God. And as this this section closes, we see a reminder that it's all about Jesus. Not just in wisdom, but in everything. In verse 30, it says, And because of him... You are in Christ Jesus. Listen to this. It says, who became to us wisdom from God, meaning Jesus modeled and examples for us godly wisdom. Because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became, to, who became to us wisdom from God. He showed us the way. He led the way in wisdom. And then it says this, but not only did he lead the way in wisdom, he led the way in righteousness. He led the way in sanctification. He led the way in redemption. So that it is written, Let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Here's what God's saying. Wisdom, the wisdom of God is found through my son by way of the cross. And the culture that he's writing, she says, I know that you think the cross is foolishness and we shouldn't even bring it up because of how heinous and horrible it is. But the cross is the way to the wisdom of God because it is the way to God because of Jesus. And he said, my son, Jesus Christ, he became wisdom from God to show us that. But not only that, he showed us about righteousness and he example to us about sanctification, which is the process of becoming more like Christ and redemption, which is being purchased and being made right in the sight of God because of Jesus. And he did all this so that none of us could ever say it's about us, so that if we boast about who we are in Christ, we boast about God and God alone. Church, listen, if there's anything good about your life and my life, it's that Jesus Christ lives within us. That's what we boast about. There are, the scripture says, and I don't have this for you, our best 15 minutes are as filthy rags. The scripture doesn't say 15 minutes. But it says our best days are the best day that you ever lived. If you woke up tomorrow and you say, I'm gonna, this is my best day. I'm going to see if I can get to nine o'clock without sinning. This is going to be my best day, right? Our best days fall so far short of what's necessary to purchase our salvation. So if we boast about who we are in Christ, we boast in God and God alone. And to live a life of wisdom is to live a life committed to the word of God and the truth of God. It is a commitment to the scriptures and the truths that are found in God's holy word. And when we learn and and memorize God's word, our next step then is to be obedient, to live those things out in our life. And as I mentioned at the beginning of this message, church, the culture that we live in is sprinting in the opposite direction of God. The culture we live in is, is running as fast as it can in the opposite direction of his word. And I know that there's things and scenarios and situations in God's word that affect us personally. There's things that God's against that people you love are for. There's things that God's for that people you love are against or maybe in your own life. And God's word at times is seen as outdated, it's antiquated, and it's out of touch with the world we live in today. But I'm telling you, if we truly desire to live the wisdom of God, we have to hold fast to his word. We have to hold tightly to his word, especially in the places where it affects us the most especially with the truths and principles that have a direct impact on our lives and on those we love. We must stand firm on those truths in the Bible, not be swayed by a culture screaming that we are unkind or unloving or out of touch. We stand firm on the word because that's how you live in wisdom. No matter what, as best we can, we rightly divide the truth of God for our own lives and we live it, especially when it collides with things in culture that are, antagonistic toward the things of God and the truth of God. And we know that all this was exampled by Jesus. In the book of Luke, it says, Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and with man. And he's not only our example, he's our means for salvation. And the wisdom of God that we so desperately need in our lives can only be experienced by Jesus, through Jesus, by way of the cross.
So if you're hoping to live your life, hoping to find peace with God through all of the things that you do on your own and all the wisdom attained by the world, you are only ever going to find chaos and you're only ever going to find frustration. On your best days and on my best days, it is still going to be chaotic, unspiritual, and frustrating. But when we trust Jesus and surrender our life to him, he's the way to peace with God. And he's the way to experience the wisdom of God. In Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8, it says this. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Forever. And at a time in our culture that attempts to pull us away from the wisdom of God, and it tempts us and nags us and nudges us to live by the wisdom of the world, church, let's remain steadfast and immovable as we hold on tightly to God's word and to God's wisdom, which was example to us by his son, Jesus Christ, who came so that we might be right with God and we might live in fellowship and intimacy with God by observing the wisdom and the redemption modeled by his son, Jesus Christ. I'm gonna ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes just for a moment. I want us to take this time just to pause just for, for a moment. And just ask of the Lord to speak into our hearts what he wants to speak into our hearts this morning based on the scriptures. Church, I know it is so difficult in the time which we live when everything is so charged all the time. So many biblical principles are under attack. And it's more difficult for our students in school for you at your jobs. But God's word is unchanging and immovable and it's steadfast and it's still the way to live a life of wisdom. There are going to be times in our lives where we are tempted, maybe even captured and captivated by the wisdom of the world. That maybe somehow the things of God, the ways of God, the precepts of God are somehow outdated and antiquated. Especially in the places where it collides with things that the culture is trying to make normal for us. But living a life of wisdom is holding fast to the truth of Scripture, following the example of Christ, and being steadfast and immovable on God's Word. If you're here this morning and you've just been searching for peace and hope in your life and all the things you've tried on your own have come up short, I want to lovingly let you know that that's going to be a continual process of frustration for you until you surrender your life to the person of Jesus Christ. (laughs) To the Corinthian culture and maybe even to ours, the idea of the cross being the instrument used for our salvation does seem in somewhat way foolish, but it's the way that God chose to demonstrate his love for us by sending his only son Jesus to the cross so that we might have hope and peace. And if you're here this morning and have never surrendered your life to Jesus to become a follower of him, to follow his will and his ways, let today be your day of salvation. Don't wait another moment. Don't try another way that the world is offering you to find peace or hope. Surrender your life to Jesus by way of the cross because what the world sees as an instrument of death or torture was was a means of love by a holy God to draw us to himself. If you're here this morning, you say, McLean, I am a follower of Jesus, but I'm just really struggling in my life to discern what's the wisdom of the world and what's the wisdom of God. I want to pray for you and I want to encourage you to be faithful in the spiritual disciplines. Continue to pray and ask God to help you and he will. He'll show us the way. But let's make a commitment or a renewed commitment in our lives to live according to the word of God. To live according to the principles of God. If there's a decision you need to make, if you need to be baptized or you want to unite with our church or if there's something we can pray about for you, there's cards all around that you can indicate that decision. We would love to walk alongside with you. So Jesus, in these next few moments, we just ask for great clarity. Now we're so grateful for the word that it's steadfast and that as other things come and go, that your word remains forever and will. It is your God-breathed truth for us. So God, help us to hold fast to your word, to cling tightly to the cross of Jesus Christ for our salvation. 
And God, help us to live and follow the example of Jesus in every way that he modeled for us of wisdom and salvation and holiness. God, we want to be right with you. And Father, we want to live by the wisdom of your word. But God, we desperately need your help. God, help our moments of unbelief. Give us strength and sensitivity to the Holy Spirit of God that indwells our hearts. And Father, we pray that we would live in such a way that if there's anything to boast about our lives, we boast in you and you alone. In Jesus' name, amen.